I will start speaking in German, but then we switch to English. Ähm, mein Name ist Leonie kubik steltig und ich äh, begrüße ganz herzlich äh, Margarita Zumu auf der Bühne, Kuratorin und Moderatorin dieses Abends, äh, Alicia Bayer, Sarah Deer, Ruth Taylor und Nike van Denta. We're very happy to have you all here today. Diese Veranstaltung war auf Englisch angekündigt. Wir haben einen internationalen Gast auf dem Panel, Ruth Taylor. Und ähm, wir werden die Ver Veranstaltung wie angekündigt auf Englisch machen. Sie können aber später gerne auf Deutsch auch Nachfragen stellen, wenn Sie des Englischen nicht so mächtig sein sollten. Wir können dann übersetzen. Und sollte jetzt jemand überhaupt kein Englisch sprechen oder verstehen vor allem, dann können Sie sich jetzt einen Hörverstärker bei meiner Kollegin Alice nehmen. Und wir haben das intern heute noch spontan organisiert, dass eine Kollegin von mir für Sie übersetzen wird. Ähm, erwarten Sie bitte keine super professionelle Simultanübersetzung, aber Sie werden der Veranstaltung folgen können. Insofern ähm, nehmen Sie sich bitte einen Hörverstärker oder heben die Hand, dann können wir Ihnen auch helfen und zu Ihnen kommen. Okay, da Alice. Thank you. Okay, now that everyone is connected, I will switch to English. Hopefully connected in a moment. Okay, we are very happy to have you all here today for the second edition of the Pop Feminist Roundtable Facts and Fiction. Uh, we started this new format in June as a collaboration with Missy Magazine and there will be two more events next year, 2020. The event is being filmed, you can see the cameras here, and streamed live online so that also other people who can't be with us today can follow the discussion and post their questions under hashtag FemStammtisch. If you are here in the room, you don't have to use Twitter. You can actually step to the microphone later when we open it up to you for your questions. Uh, Facts and Fiction is a series of roundtable discussions uh, drawing on topical debates and selected quotes from the news and other media where dominant and populist narratives are dismantled as fiction and replaced by new positions through facts and arguments. It is important to us that this is done in a way that uh, understands anti-racism, -raci women's rights and the social question as essentially the same struggle. Today we are talking on abortion, a topic which is currently the trigger for heated discussions on concepts of family and women's role in society. So we have asked these four inspiring feminist speakers from the fields of medicine, academia, journalism and activism to join us today. Our questions here are, what are feminist positions on this controversial topic of abortion? How about the medical, social and legal implications for women aborting in Germany and internationally? How is it linked to ideas of control and ownership of the female body? Maybe you will have your own questions about this. Maybe you don't agree with some positions and we invite you to join the debate later. I will now hand over to Margarita Zumu who curates and chairs these discussions for us. She's publisher of Missy Magazine, curator of theory and discourse at Howe, and now also professor for theater in Osnabrück, Lingen. Examples of her curatorial work include Heimatfantasien at International Summer Festival Kampnagel in 2018 and Appetite Society at Documenta 14. And very currently, yesterday, I think the series Unteilbar Denken at how was it? No, no, sorry. Okay, it's one of your series. It's one of your series. Okay, yesterday was another one. You can tell us later, sorry. I'm very happy to have you here together with this amazing panel and look forward to the discussion. Thank you.
Thank you, Lerni, for this extended introduction. Uh, yes, uh, I also welcome you very warmly uh, here today to the second edition of Feministischer Stammtisch in Dresden. Um, yes, for me it's a challenge and an honor to uh, curate uh, Feministische Stammtisch Gespräche, discussions here. I come from the Berlin Blase and uh, it is really uh, for me interesting, challenging, but also politically very important to be here. So uh, I'm very happy that um, yeah, you came to listen to us and um, that there is a public for feminism uh, here, of course, and there's a lot of activism also, of course. We will talk about this later. Um, Leonie said, what we are going to talk about on abortion, whose body is it anyway? And uh, yes, this is a subject that is a classical subject of feminism, as you might know. If you want, it's a core subject of feminism because it touches upon basic rights. It touches upon the right of self-determination of women or people who can get pregnant over their own body and it touches upon also the right of self-controlled family planning. The, these are rights that are also internationally recognized as reproductive rights. Mm, yes, feminists are also discussing abortions in centuries because it refers to issues of women's health, advocating for security and protection of the female body. But, as you also heard, abortion has never been an issue that uh, is discussed only among women. It has always been a very heated trigger issue um, for, for the whole society. Um, yes, and I think it, it has also to do with um, the, the question of how do we conceive the role of the woman in society. So what female citizens are allowed to do or are supposed to do or not do with their bodies in society depends on politics and ethics in a society. And these ethics, of course, are grounded on our imaginaries of gender and of our gendered visions of uh, the concept of the family and uh, the concept of our roles um, in the family. So it is no wonder, I think, that abortion uh, and the discussion about abortion arises anew every time when we have a political or moral shift in society and they become again and again battleground for feminists. Mm. Since we are talking about battlegrounds, I um, uh, have to, or am entitled to, read to you the values, the rules, um, uh, the Hausrecht, the domicile roots, rules of the Deutsches Hygienemuseum, um, uh, what we want to, uh, uh, to describe, how we want to discuss here with you. So I'm uh, reading out these rules. I have been given the rights to act in the interest of the museum and exercise the domestic property rights where and when needed. This museum aims to be a forum for debate. Scientific, cultural and societal themes are being discussed in different types of events. Many people with different backgrounds come together here to talk to each other. We want to discuss controversial topics and opinions in a positive and inspiring way. This is only possible if we respect each other, even in heated discussions, without personally attacking, discrediting or offending other people. With a fair debating culture, we aim to contribute to a way of discussing things which is open-minded, tolerant and respectful. We believe that a democratic society can only work in this way. End of this formal speech. So yes, today I have the pleasure to uh, discuss with uh, some finest experts 
uh, on the issue of abortion, the finest I could find. Um, we will focus on medical issues uh, of health in abortion, the international context and discourse on abortion, as well as the ethical dimension and the gender imaginaries that play a role in the debate. And we will again, as last time also, Leonie talked about the format, take quotes from, from the press or quotes of um, different persons as point of departure for our analysis. So we bring in different opinions in our discussions. Um, so I would like to start with my first guest, which is Alicia Bayer. Um, I'm very happy that Alicia Bayer is here. You might know her from Funk und Fernsehen. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Alicia is an uh, yes, outspoken uh, doctor, uh, also in the field of abortion. She's a doctor and uh, an activist. Alicia, you're a funder of the University Group Medical Students for Choice in Berlin, which supports better medical teaching on abortion in uh, universities. You're also involved in finding the organization of Doctors for Choice in Germany, which is now founded. And uh, you now learn how to practice abortion in the doctor's office of Christina Hennel. Christina Hennel, who has become an iconic doctor in the fight for liberalization of abortions in Germany since she was condemned for having information on uh, her website on abortion on the basis of paragraph 219a in the German law. So, Alicia, my first question is why it was important to you to organize for improving the medical study syllabus in universities or on abortion? Is there a lack on research? Is there a lack of teaching or is it a false way of teaching abortions? Thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me today. Good evening. Um, yeah, indeed, there is a lack um, both of research and um, medical teaching on abortion. I can best talk about the situation of the University in Berlin, um, the Charité, it's the biggest um, university hospital in Europe. And back then in 2015, when um, Medical Students for Choice Berlin got started, um, in the six years of medical studies, um, there was talked only 10 minutes about abortion and only about the legal aspects of abortion. So nothing about the, the um, medical methods. We now um, could change the curriculum in the syllabus syllabus in um, Berlin, luckily, because of uh, yeah public pressure and also the papaya workshops that we organized. Um, so now all the aspects are included there. But the problem is not only in Berlin, it's in many German cities at many medical faculties um, that either abortion is not teached at all, taught at all, or um, if it is taught, then only ethical or legal aspects of abortion. And this shows already how abortion also, not only within society, but also within med the medical community is really a uh, taboo. And then it goes on in the, if you um, finish your medical studies, you normally specialize for example, in gynecology, and you go to a hospital where you normally should learn all the procedures that belong to your specialization subject. And um, concerning abortion, the problem is that many hospitals don't provide abortions. There has been a decrease um, of 40% since 2003 of um, uh, practices and hospitals who who um, provide abortions, so um, you have to be lucky to to um, get to a hospital where they do abortions and where you can learn it. Um, and why is it a problem that there is no uh, real studies on it in the medical schools? What is there a consequence out of it? Of course, it is because um, it's a very frequent 
medical procedure. It's not a rare case. Uh, many people think oh, this just happens to someone who didn't care about contraception, but it's not. In the US, there are studies that um, show that every fourth woman within her lifetime will have an abortion. In Germany, the, the numbers are a bit lower, but it, it concerns so many women. And if the doctors don't know about this procedure, this is, um, of course, risky. And we see this, for example, in um, and also it's it's um, a problem because they don't um, we, we don't have enough abortion providers because if you never get in contact with this topic during your education you will not in the end when you have your own practice say oh yeah I might offer abor abortions because you never got in contact with this topic it, it was excluded um, and also what is very um, um, makes me afraid is that 15% of uh, abortions in Germany are still done um, with the curatage, curatage, oh, oh God, in English, I don't know. Uh, it's the same? Yeah. So not with the vacuum aspiration, what would be the best and mo uh, safest method and which is recommended by the World Health Organization, but by with a less safe uh, method. Okay, um, uh, you brought a quote, um, uh, it's a quote of Jens Spahn, maybe we can see it in the monitor. The Minister of Health in Germany, this quote was published on the website of English-speaking radio KCRW, it's an English-speaking radio in Germany, and um, the quote is, with this compromise, and we will also talk about which compromise he's talking about, with this compromise, the ground coalition finds a fair balance. Women seeking help in conflict situations need to know which doctor they can turn to. Advertising for abortions will, be not, will not be made in the future. Abortion is not a medical procedure like any other. So uh, the context is that Jens Spad is advocating for the political compromise they found on the uh, article 2019a that prohibits the possibility of doctors to advertise that they practice abortion. Prohibited, prohibited. Now they can advertise that they do it. Um, yes. So what do you? What would you say about this quote? Um, is it? I mean, it looks as if it is a quite fair compromise, fair balanced situation. This is what he's, this is what he's arguing. Do you think it's a fair balanced situation? No, I don't agree. Is it on? Is it on? Ah, oh yeah, no. Uh, I don't agree that it's a fair um, compromise. Um, maybe just to to summarize what is the content of of the new paragraph. Now doctors can say that they provide abortions, but they cannot give any further information, not even which method they provide, up to which week, or how they do it. Um, and the second is, um, content point is that there is a central list now by the um, Bundesärztekammer, the, the medical association, um, uh, where they list all the addresses of all the abortion providers um, throughout Germany. But this list is very incomplete. There are more or less 300 addresses listed, and um, many from Berlin and Hamburg, where there have been lists before already. So they were m mostly just transferred to this new list, list, but many regions are missing out. And also this list doesn't provide a lot of information. It just says which method, medication or surgical method, but it doesn't say if it's the old surgical method, the curatage or the, the safe one, the new one, and it doesn't say up to which week, and yeah, it's not, it's not information like I would say uh, information should look like. And the second thing is that the contraception pill is now um, refunded up to 22 years instead of 20 years, which is quite random, and also I think it won't change anything in the abortion rates, the most abortions are between 25 and 35 and not at this very young age. This is just a prejudice. Um, yeah. So this is the new compromise and I don't think that it's fair because still objective, correct and neutral information about abortion 
by um, experienced doctors is um, prohibited. And Germany is almost the only country in Europe who prohibits information about um, abortion. Um, and what about the... He says abortion is not a medical procedure like any other. What would you say as a doctor? Yeah, this is an interesting point. Um, I think many doctors would probably also say it's not a medical procedure like any other because there are more aspects involved. But I would um, draw another conclusion from this than he would do probably. I think for him this means it's such a different thing. It doesn't belong to medicine. It should be a stigma and a taboo. And I would rather say, um, um, especially because there are so many aspects involved, it, it, we have to talk about it and we have to teach it and we have to um, um, teach doctors also how important it is that there is safe access to this um, procedure. Does anyone want to jump in in this question? Do any one of you want to also react on this quote? Uh, react like this. Okay. Yeah, I would just like to add, um, also I'm, I'm Zara, I work in this um, organization called Georgia Basha and Barbara and we help Polish women having abortions in Germany because in Poland it's totally illegal. And I just wanted to add um, to, to the method, you know, or to the information that um, as we even get um, now questions from German women, even though we actually take care of Polish women, but we get more and more calls from women in Germany because they don't know where to get help. They don't know, you know, where to get information and also especially on the methods, you know, and I think the what you really want as I said very clearly, but I think I want to just emphasize it again, you know, like there's no, also nobody, also service gets worse, of course, if women cannot really um, get a really good overview about the different methods that exist, you know, like actually when you have a lack of information um, that endangers women, you know, and I think this is something that this totally doesn't see, you know, like it's the, again this idea that, um, you know, it is kind of like uh, something that you shouldn't talk about, you know, like it's, um, you know, information should be taken away from women, you know, and I think something cannot never be safe, you know, and fair if you take away information from for, for women. I you mean, know? the so argument is, if women don't know how to um, have an abortion, that there will be less abortions. Is this the case? I mean, if you don't know, if there's no, inf no information, you would rather, you don't know how to do it, so you get the child, right? This is a no. bit like, because if you... Yeah. No, it's very dangerous, because if you don't know where you can get it, you might try to do it yourselves. And um, yeah, and this is very uh, dangerous. We know this from countries where it is more restrictive even. Yeah. And um, I just wanted to add in my daily practice now, I see that even after this uh, new compromise, um, the information situation is really bad still. There's so much misleading and false and biased information in the internet. Um, and women come and sometimes ask if if the procedure will really be this bloody and and painful and cruel, how they read it in the internet, so they they come and they they are really misinformed, yeah. And also, um, advertising for abortions will not be made in the future. Yes, it will not be made, but it would also not be made if this paragraph was abolished, because in our professional code of doctors, it is forbidden to um, advertise for any medical procedure. So, um, yeah, it makes no sense to have an extra paragraph on this. Yeah, so um, prohibiting information might not solve a lot of problems um, for the women involved. Maybe we um, go further with Nike, Nike van Dinta. Um, Nike, you are an author, you are a uh, vastly read uh, blogger from This Is Jane Wayne. Uh, you're a journalist and uh, yes, what you did was a quite courageous thing. Um, firstly, you outed yourself as someone who had an abortion um, uh, in an article, also in a podcast you do in This Is Jane Wayne. 
also as someone who had already a child and had an abortion after being also a mother. And uh, then you also, after uh, Jens Spahn um, uh, launched, wanted to launch a program, a uh, study, uh, a research project on the psychological consequences of abortion, where he wanted to spend five million euros. He wants. He wants actually. to spend, yes. I thought because of your action it did not happen. Yeah, um, so he uh, wants to spend five million uh, euros on a research project on the psychological consequences on, of abortion. And you did a campaign for signatures under the hashtag, hashtag was für ein Spahn. Um, uh, you people signed more than nine, uh, uh, 90,000 people have already signed. Um, yeah, so my question is why was it important to you to actually launch this campaign and to also out yourself as someone who had an abortion? Um, I think first, when it comes to the campaign, um, I was actually lying down in bed because I didn't feel very well mentally and because of my body and I felt very weak and the day I read about Jens Spahn's um, five million dollar mission, <laughs> uh, Euro mission, I became very strong because I was so, so angry. You know, at the beginning of the year I promised myself to calm down and to not the typical angry feminist kind of woman, but no, I am angry and I still am because the thing that was the most, like the biggest joke about the whole thing was that media kind of wrote about it as Jens Spahn would really care about women, you know, but this is not about helping women. This is about control, and it's not about like being an ally or caring about our psychology or whatever. It's just another step backwards, because when we think about the studies, like first it seems like great, knowing more about female or the psychology of people who can get pregnant, pregnant it sounds great, but what if he what will he find out? Because there are studies, you know, and this um, syndrome he's talking about, um, it doesn't exist. Science does not, like, they, they didn't validate it. it. It's just not existing. And of Maybe course... You, you can say how it's called, the syndrome? H how is it in English? Post-abortion post syndrome. And this is the whole thing. Um, he wants us to be sad. He wants us to be depressed. And you know what? We can be sad. And we also can be very, very, very sad after having an abortion. It's our right because we are humans and we are no robots. But that doesn't mean at all that we shouldn't have the right to do abortions and to control and have the power about our own bodies. And how on earth will you ever compare your situation, your mental health after having an abortion to what would have happened if you would have got the child you didn't want. It's a complete joke and it's misogynist and it's against women, it's anti-woman and nothing else. Maybe we can look at the quote uh, you brought. Um, to It's the quote um, from T Online. Um, which I don't see. Um, yes, because it, it goes into this line of thought and we can continue talking about this uh, question of if there is psychological problems. So um, it, is a it is an article that quotes uh, uh, vastly Mr. Reinhard Klein from the Beratungsstelle, from this advising office, Ausweg. Um, and he says, we are convinced that if all women would come out and talk about how bad they feel after an abortion mentally and emotionally, we would have a discussion regarding Article 218 and apparently nobody wants to have it. So what do you say about this quote? Um, this is just pure fiction. Let's just say this because um, when you really trust in science and believe in women, what you should do, both of it, um, you will see that most of the women feel relief and not depression. 
and as I said before, it's totally okay to be sad. And I myself, I have been in a conflict situation and it wasn't easy. But I made the mistake, like writing down, it wasn't easy. And afterwards I found out, I, I'm only saying this again and again to kind of, um, you know, to protect myself from others, from the stigma other people like make me feel. And this is the whole thing. If we would recognize that some of the, or like many females or people who can get, uh, can get pregnant would be sad afterwards or have problems, it's not because of the abortion, it's about society, it's because of society, it's because of the German law, it's because it makes them feel guilty, but they are not, and that's the whole problem. And that, again, is my biggest problem with um, Jens Spahn's plans, because it's not us and our body and our right to choose that makes us sick. It's the law and the whole society that, of course, learns, you know. Politics still are something people look up to and they're like, oh, if the German law says it's a crime, maybe it is a crime, you know. And um, also, like, religion. I don't believe in God, but that doesn't matter at all. I respect everybody who believes in God or something like that but I want them to respect my freedom, you know? And what Jens Spahn is doing is also using religion to, like, punish women. It's, it's, it's cruel. In, in what way? I think it's very populistic, you know, the way he arguments. It's always about, like, um, emotions and about life. And also he said once that we, like the feminists, I guess, or the women who are pro-abortions, we care more about um, animals than about human, human beings or babies. And this is so populistic and it's so, like it's food also for the right-wing parties, for the very, very right-wing parties. It's the same, it's just the whole thing. But you know, it's it's the CSU, and it's not the AFD, but they are pretty much similar when it comes to those um, topics. And on abortion, female rights, reproductive rights, and this is very, very crazy. Does anyone have to add something? Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things about this quote is I think that actually if they got the data, the conversation would flip the way around that they don't want it to because they would see what's true, which is that most women don't regret their abortions. Most women are happy they had an abortion. And like you say, there's a degree of stigma which goes along with it, and that's present in, I think, every society and every culture. And that's what can make women feel stigmatized, is because they're not allowed to be pleased or relieved, even if that really is how they feel. And there's a lot of data, for, especially from the US, about the outcomes of women who are forced to have abortions. There's a study called the Turnaway Study. Um, women who um, wanted abortions who weren't allowed to have them. And their mental and physical health outcomes and the health outcomes and the social outcomes of the children that they were forced to carry to term are so bad. They're very bad. Yeah. You see, there are studies about that, and um, so this leads to the question, what does Jens Spahn want? Yeah. What does he really want? And this is so dangerous because we're really taking like steps back. We're going back in time, and we're fighting for this for so many years. And also, um, he pretty much shows that we don't matter and that he doesn't take us serious. Mm -hmm. He thinks we're popping like the pill like Smarties, that's a quote, I didn't, you know, just made it up in my mind. Like, he's a bit like, oh, do you're doing advertising for abortions? Well, probably women will have like three uh, abortions a year when it's like to the price, like double the price or half the price, whatever. It's so, like, what does he think he is and what does he think is inside our heads? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and I just want to add, I think the, the really problematic thing also about this is that, that the whole idea buys into this idea that pregnancy in general is a kind of a door towards the lunacy of women, the madness mm -hmm. of women, you know? And I think this, is, this was always a reason why self-determination was taken away from women because they were saying, oh, women are crazy anyway when they're pregnant, you know, whatever they do, kind of, you know? And I think this is also important to understand that it's not just about abortion, it's about general women's health, you know? As a general, women are pathologists 
strategized when it comes to women's health, you know, in terms of how can they control, have control about it, you know, what is the outcome, you know. I mean, as well, you said, you know, of course, there might be women who might be sad about it, but sad doesn't mean pathological. Mm -hmm. Sad doesn't mean crazy, you know. And I mean, if you think about how many women have abortions, you know, I mean, I guess the official statistics from the World Health Organization, up to four women, also, you know, every fourth woman has an abortion in her life, you know. I mean, do you want to say every fourth woman is crazy, you know, in this world, you know. And I guess, indeed, this has to do with isolation when f women feel bad, you know, that they cannot ex they share their and experience, And I think, you know. to that point, if you're actually talking, if you actually care about women's mental health, you'd be caring more about postnatal depression, which affects, I think, far more women than those who say they regret their abortions. In the UK, if you have an abortion, you can go for counselling after your abortion, but less than 10% of women take up that option because they don't feel they need it. If you look at the number of women who suffer from postnatal depression or depression during pregnancy, you're right, you're pathologising women in a way that only speaks to their role when they can get pregnant, not once they're existing as a person in the world. But, but I also get one more sentence, you know, that because I think it then this is why, why it's also important to connect birth rights as a right how to self-determination in birth and abortion because I think also because women are pathologized in women's health, it's not just abortion where women, like the self-determination is being taken away, but also birth and pregnancy in general, you know. And this is also why I think it is super important to connect these issues and not show them as opposites, you know, because I think a, a, a society which has a problem with self-determination abortion also has a problem with self-determination in pregnancy and giving birth and this is also what we see you know so um, you know women have a really hard time to create their own birth experience as well as their own abortion experience you know and with this kind of um, you know quotes that you're saying it's we, we, we cannot even think about that we have the right to create our own abortion experience this is not even something we can fathom you know because it's so isolated and alienated from from our actually life reality you know and what we actually would like to do it's so medicalized and controlled that yeah women don't even have a chance to say like, oh, I would like to experience my abortion like this and this and this, maybe at home, maybe with friends, maybe with a ritual, you know, or whatever, you know, like this is not even in the question because it's so taken away from women, you know. Yeah, I just wanted to add to what you said about the psychological burden, which is higher after birth than after abortion. It's the same with the physical risk. There's also a myth about um, abortion will cause infertility and um, later um, early um, births and frühgeburt. Um, yeah, no matter. And um, but actually, um, um, ending the. Um, Leading the pregnancy to birth is 10 times more risky to your health than having an, an abortion. But even within medical community, many still think, yeah, abortion is very risky for your health. Yeah, thank you for that. And I want to, to make the point clear that when we say that um, there is postnatal depression, we don't speak against birth of children. We yeah. don't speak against becoming a mother. To make it clear, I think you... Um, touched upon this, that reproductive rights are birth rights and abortion rights, and it's about self-determination and all of this, and this is mm -hmm. what we're talking about, and we're not advocates against uh, becoming children. Um, you want to add something last? I just wanted to, to, to say that, yes. no, it's also about mothers who want to take care of their child mm -hmm. they already have, and this is very important. This was also the same for me, because I, it, wasn't, it was a toxic relationship with the boyfriend I had at the time I got pregnant for the second time, and I knew I couldn't handle it alone, and I don't know like, if I would have the life I have now with my brilliant son, um, and th the time I have with him now. Um, so it's also, it's also a social question, not only, and a question for mothers too. Yeah, um, we had a patient who said, for me it's not a decision against something, it's a decision for something, my kids. Yeah. I found that a very nice, um, cool saying. Okay, um, very nice. We go further uh, with Ruth Taylor. 
uh, our international guest. Uh, Ruth, uh, you are the CEO of the Abortion Support Network in the UK. Your organization is based in London uh, and you help women in other European countries. You have, help, have uh, helped them in Ireland, Northern Ireland, the Isle of Man, in Malta, in Gibraltar. Um, to find access to safe abortions. Um, and uh, I think the, it is an interesting fact that abortion laws throughout Europe are very different. Um, and we think of abortion, especially in Germany, as something um, that is decided by moral uh, and ethics that is above everything. But actually, you see that the ethics are very different depending on what the legal situation is in every country. So for example, me, I come from Greece. Uh, Greece uh, has legalized abortion since the 80s. It was a social democratic government who did it. And uh, my mother has aborted, my aunt has aborted, and I never remembered there was not a talk on guilt, also in public discussion. There's not a talk of, of guilt, and there's not a talk of psycho uh, problems, um, uh, because it is a human right that women are entitled uh, to. And so there is, of course, no discourse of guilt and no pathologization for a human right that you're entitled to take. So I found it very interesting when I came to Germany and I realized the discussion here, and I'm still actually quite, um, yeah, I observe it uh, um, uh, quite um, uh, with an uh, interest in um, how different the moral and the ethic is depending on the legal uh, situation. So maybe you can give us an a overview how these things are dealt with in the UK, mm. the legal and then also uh, the moral discussion, and some of the other countries as examples. We have an overview. Yeah, for sure. So that's absolutely something that I've observed. Um, I've been doing this job for nearly two years, and it's quite surprising how diverse the laws are around Europe. Um, and I think people tend to think that the situation is the same in other countries as it is in their own place of birth, as it is where they live. Um, so I'm from the UK, I grew up in London, and my organisation primarily supports people who need to travel to the UK. And one of the reasons we do that is because the UK has a um, quite a kind abortion law. Um, abortion has been legal in the UK since 1967, so over 50 years. Um, and that was something called the Abortion Act, which covers England, Scotland and Wales. Until two weeks ago, it was still illegal in Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK, but that changed just a fortnight ago. Um, and the situation we have in the UK is slightly complicated in that while it is legal, it is still also criminalised in the wrong circumstances. So we've got a very strong campaign going on at the moment to change that. No one has ever been prosecuted under it. Um, what it means is that um, if a woman wants an abortion, it has to be approved by two doctors. And if it weren't approved by two doctors, there would be a case for criminalisation of someone who is involved. But that's never happened in 50 years. So we have this strange situation where the law needs to change because actually people are using it, um, are using it in line with the law, but the law no longer makes sense because it was 50 years ago. However, what it means in practice is you can get an abortion in most parts of the UK up to 23 weeks and five days, um, which is the latest in Europe. Um, and the next longest you can get an abortion in Europe is in the Netherlands, which is to 22 weeks, five days. Um, and I think it's really interesting, this point about is it governed by a moral question or an idea around guilt? And obviously, um, every individual has a different sense of morality from the person sitting next to them. Um, but everyone is also informed by their sense of um, social duty and what politics tells them and what their friends and family tell them. And I think because abortion has been legal in the UK for such a long time, while there is still stigma, I think the stigma isn't as high and I think the question of morality is less in debate. What there is from more right-wing um, sides of society and our more conservative um, politicians is some people want to change the legal limit. They want to make it that you, you know, they want to make it um, smaller, shorter, 
Um, however, I think that is quite unlikely to change. Um, what's really interesting, thinking about morality, is looking at the case of Ireland. Um, so um, Ireland had a law called the Eighth Amendment, which meant that um, abortion was um, illegal in all circumstances, um, except to save the life of a mother. Um, and they, in fact, um, never even used the law when they did need to save the life of a woman. For example, Savita Halapanova, who died in 2012. Um, and it was pretty much after Savita's death that there became a real change in Ireland and people really pushing to get rid of this Eighth Amendment. Um, and they had a referendum in May last year. And two-thirds of the population voted to repeal the Eighth Amendment and therefore to make abortion legal. Um, which was absolutely incredible. And part of the way they did that was by shifting the conversation away from morality and away from religion, because obviously Ireland is a deeply culturally Catholic country, um, but shifting that conversation away from what God thinks um, or what the church thinks or what is morally right or wrong towards the fact that everyone in Ireland knew someone who'd had an abortion. Everyone in Ireland knew someone who'd either left the country or who'd bought pills on the internet or who'd done something much more dangerous than that if they were older. And people felt like they were letting down their friends and family. They felt that it was shrouded in secrecy. They were making criminals of themselves and of their sisters and of their friends. And so people voted for women's bodily autonomy and for their right to make a decision about their own lives in their own country without having to get a flight somewhere or, you know, take a ferry. Um, and that is incredibly powerful, I think, um, because the Irish situation is one that is more extreme than it is in Germany at the moment. You know, it's um, a deeply Catholic country, still is, but also people had started to feel very let down by the church because of a number of different things that had happened, a lot of things that had happened involving women. And actually, when it came down to it, people realized that this was a question of health, of human rights, and of women being able to make decisions about their own bodies. So the morality question really does vary around Europe. Um, we're going to talk about Malta in a minute, so I won't move on to that. But um, it really, and I think it's interesting because it's very varied, but it can shift, is what Ireland shows us. Um, yes, maybe we, we uh, take the quotes that you sent to us and continue the conversation with it. It is the quote um, about Malta. Mm. Um, when uh, Abortion Support Network started to operate in Malta, uh, the, the magazine Times of Malta wrote, the family ministry should tell the Abortion Support Network to stop inciting means encouraging women in Malta to kill their unborn children by abortion. Maltese society does not want that. One day it will also be harvesting pre-born baby body parts, like Planned Parenthood is doing in the USA and elsewhere, to be used in universities or industrial laboratories for experimental purposes. That is the commodification of the unborn. So there's lots of things said here. First of all, I wanted to ask you how do you relate um, to this question of encouraging women? Like um, if organization like yours is encouraging women to have abortions. So we are not encouraging women to have abortions. We are responding to the fact that women and pregnant people, um, people who have uteruses, will always have abortions. They have always had abortions since we've been humans and probably since before when we were the thing we were before we were humans. Um, people will always have abortions, just as people will always have miscarriages, just as people will always have babies. For as long as humanity can get pregnant, we will be having abortions. Um, and this idea of us inciting women to kill their unborn children is just laughable. Um, we opened our service to people from Malta in February this year because so many people from Malta had told us that they needed us. So we opened our service because we knew there were people in Malta who needed abortions and who couldn't afford them. Um, we exist to help people who can't afford an abortion. 
because what happens when you make abortion illegal or hard to access is you make safe abortion illegal and hard to access and you make it so that women who have money have options because they can leave the country, they can go somewhere else and they have resources and women who don't have money have babies that they don't want and can't afford. If you can't afford an abortion, you can't afford a baby. So we opened up in Malta to help people who wanted to get abortions. Um, if someone calls us or emails us, we never ask them how they got pregnant or why they want an abortion. And we also never try and persuade them that having an abortion is the right thing to do. And actually quite, you know, every now and then someone gets in touch with us and says, look, I've had a baby. And actually that is a wonderful outcome if they changed their mind and decided they wanted that baby. What we don't want is that there's people having children that they don't want. Because as I said just previously, those babies don't have particularly good health outcomes or lives. So we are not inciting anyone to kill their unborn children. Um, we're just um, helping people who think that they might want to terminate a pregnancy do that safely, legally, and with financial help if they need it. You touched upon the question of, um, actually a class question, about the social backgrounds of the people. You also mentioned it before, mm -hmm. um, that there is, or, and uh, on your website, it's interesting that you really address especially people um, who might not have the money to migrate, who might not have also all the accesses um, uh, to information, who might not speak the language, mm -hmm. etc. So maybe you have also a comment on this. I think this is especially interesting that um, uh, because of of course, uh, a lot of people in Germany say, yes, it is illegal, but it is straffrei, so you are not punished under certain circumstances, and if you know how to do it, you can do it. But the question is really, I think, whom we are talking about. No? Actually, we're talking about women who can afford it, and we're not talking about those who don't have 500 euros cash to have their abortion, because this is the truth, and we're also talking about women who can't afford to go to another city, and for us it may seem funny not having the money to pay a bus or whatever, but if you have to go back and forth and back and forth, maybe one hour drive, it can be expensive and it can be too expensive. And this is a problem, and it's a problem of healthcare, and it's a problem that you also mentioned that there are just not enough doctors who are performing or doing um, abortions. And we are lucky in Berlin, like where I come from. Um, I, I had it kind of easy, um, but like live in Bavaria or somewhere else, it's, it's pretty common to, that you have to have a one hour drive to find someone who can also inform you, not only having an abortion, but also inform you. And it's, a, it's also a question of trust, because um, if you are in a conflict situation as a woman, you really want to talk about your doctor, you know? And if the doctor doesn't do abortions because of the law and because she or he is afraid of doing so, then you have another problem because you don't know whom to talk to. And then you do what I did, Google, and um, use the internet, and then you get tons of pictures you really don't want to see because it's not information and it's not objective. It's populistic and it only goes the one, the one way to criminalize this. And so it's a huge problem with many, many um, small points involved. And I think essentially anywhere where you have to pay for abortion, it becomes a class issue. Um, you know, we support people who don't have the money to make the journey, who need help um, with paying for their flights and paying for their abortion and travel. And that's not everyone. We only provide funding to about 70% of people who call us because the other, no, to about 30% of people who call us, sorry. It's about 70% of people find out they do have enough money and they are able to do it. But we ask them lots of questions and we're trying to work out how can we help them best? Because what happens is you've got people who really can't afford to have an abortion they definitely can't afford to have a baby. And it does come back to this problem of access as well and provision, because actually, even if you have quite a good law, your provision might not be very good. So something that happens sometimes in the UK, 
our healthcare system is free at point of use, as is an abortion. So that means you don't have to pay anything. However, we get called by people who live in rural areas, for example. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had someone get in touch who needed to go to two appointments because she was having a medical abortion, not surgical. Um, the clinic was 100 miles away because she lived in rural Wales and the train tickets were 60 pounds each time and she didn't have that money. Um, so we were able to help her, but the clinic couldn't help her and our NHS couldn't help her. So there's always still going to be people like that who book an appointment and then discover they can't go because they didn't have the money. Mm -hmm. um, I would say we, we continue with Sarah um, and then uh, we see what is left to say. Um, yes, so Sarah, Sarah Deal. Uh, you are an author, um, uh, you also brought some books that are sold uh, outside, a uh, fiction writer, but also someone who writes um, Sachbücher, books on, on certain subjects, feminist books. You made a well-known film on abortion with the title Abortion Democracy, and you're also the co-founder of Georgia Basha an organization of activists is that, as you said, supports Polish women to have uh, abortions in Germany since it is illegal in Poland. Um, yes, we looked at the press, uh, at the Polish press, also because since uh, you work with Polish women, we thought we might uh, also uh, talk about the situation there. And um, we found two Schlagzeilen, two titles. Um, uh, of articles um, that we brought. Maybe we can see this uh, last one, last quote. Um, the context of uh, this title of an article is uh, an article about the Committee on Women, Rights and Gender Equality of the United Nations and their Millennium Development aims. This millennium, millennium, millennium development aims secured reproductive rights and the access to abortion, especially for women in the global south. This is what it was uh, about, and this is an article that comments this millennium development aims of the Committee of Women, Rights and Gender Equality of the United Nations. And uh, it says, family, no. Abortion, yep. That's what the EU wants for the new millennium. So, Zara, what do you think um, is, uh, is actually implicitly um, said in this very short uh, title of article? <coughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you both actually said it already, um, you know, this, this, or oh, you mentioned it already by saying that, you know, a lot of people who have abortions are actually already mothers, you know, and I think this is actually the perspective that is really missing in the bigger um, abortion discourse, you know, that the, the general idea is really like abortion has to be against the family. It has to be done in a very egocentric you know, selfish way, you know, by a woman who are irresponsible, you know. And the reality is, and that's also what I see in my work that I'm, you know, doing since six years now, like supporting Polish women having abortions in Germany, is that abortion is a very responsible decision that you also make for the children you already have, you know. And I think that thought can change so much about the abortion discourse if you just really, uh, you know, get this, you know. I mean, for example, in Germany also, it's more than 60% of all people who have abortions abortions, they um, are already mothers you know, or they have already kids, you know. Um, so I think in general we still are stuck in this idea that the self-determination of women is against the society, you know. And I think that idea comes from the fact that we what do we expect from women? What do we expect from motherhood? You know, I think it has so much to do with that we want to keep women as kind of the people who um, do unpaid care work in our society. You know, they take care of children, they take care of families, they take care of the elderly. 
their needs are not as important as the need of other people. And women have to cater for the needs of other people, also even for like a tiny embryo. You know, it's more important than the woman's life, you know, and her plans and her also ability to make choices in her life, you know. And I think this idea is still so ingrained in our hearts and minds, you know, that we, as because this is like, for, I cannot tell you how alienating it is for me that we still have to talk about that topic, you know. And I am absolutely positive that if men could get pregnant too, we would wouldn't have that discussion because it would be absolutely clear that everybody needs to make such a huge decision for themselves because it is women in the end who have to take care of a child, you know, who have to know and who are the experts who know how much capacity they have to really good, you know, be good caretakers, you know, and I think this is all absolutely twisted in our society how we see this topic, you know, and um, I think in also coming back, why this is a, a quote from, from Poland, you know, I mean, Poland illegalized abortion in the middle of the 90s, you know, and it um, had a lot to do with the fact that they wanted to kind of show themselves um, that they changed after socialism, you know, they're not a socialist state anymore, now they are more like, you know, really holding up Catholic, conservative family values, you know. So illegalizing abortion was a very good way to demonstrate that they had changed, you know, that the, that the new nationalistic values are conservative, Catholic, you know, and not socialist anymore, you know. I think it has a lot to do with that, and I think it's also really important to understand um, how manipulative abortion is used by politicians, you know, I mean, of course, we, we worked a, a lot around Jens Spahn now, you know, <laughs> uh, but I think this is something that's going on in all countries, you know, and there is a huge backlash, especially in Eastern European countries now, you know, after, after the fall of socialism, that they all kind of, you know, uphold Catholic values all, all of a sudden, but I think it has a lot to do with reinventing yourself with, with new national values, you know, um, as in terms of, yeah, we want to show us as, as more moral than the others, you know, or like, you know, we, we, there's really like a change in history and now we do it totally different, you know, um, but, uh, you know, but I think it really goes along and it, you know, goes more and more into the direction of really um, supporting right-wing views and right-wing policies, you know, and I mean, um, for example, uh, somebody like Prime Minister Orban in Hungary, you know, I mean, he really openly says he opposes abortion because he wants more Hungarians to be born also against the threat of Islamization, you know, I mean, they're really openly arguing like this, you know, so they don't even start with, you know, um, the rights of the embryo and stuff like this anymore, they really openly say, you know, this is actually what it is about, you know, and um, I think this is also where you really have to think, you know, talking about the rights of the embryo, is of course um, also like something, you know, that has to be considered, you know, but I think the, the way it is used is um, that you don't have to talk about what you actually want or what the aims actually are, which is controlling women so they do unpaid care work, because this is how you bind women to the family, is that they have children, you know, more children that they, that they want, you know, or, or that they, you know, if, if they want it at all, you know, like this is how you kind of push women again into the, the realm of the family where they have to cater to all these needs so they cannot take care of themselves anymore, you know, to have their own lives, their own plans, their own power, their own agency, you know, um, and I think this is actually what this is about, but of course talking about the rights of the embryo sounds really nice and sounds really caring and sounds like you're really, you know, doing the right thing for society and, and people really get along with it because they do not question that, you know, they do not question what actually lies, lies behind this kind of rhetorics, you know. So what you're saying is um, it is actually not really about the life of the fertilized egg, because this is what we're talking about in this uh, state. Um, but it is. You know, if, if politicians would care about that, then they would have better, you know, more money for families, then they would have better childcare, you know. There are a lot of ways how to improve the life of children, but this is not what has been done, you know. It's just like women need to have more and more children, it's also to keep them down, you know. And I mean, I think it's also, you know, if you, if you have more children, then of course, you know, you have also more um, competition on the workspace, you know, you have more um, people who, um, yeah, who have to struggle in life, you know, like it's much more easy to suppress people who are poor and who don't have choices, you know. So I think it's also like something to control a whole society, you know. So you think it's, uh, you said, 
it's first about population control, um, about, and it is interesting because I found a very similar quote of the IFD of what you just talked really? about. Yeah. yeah. They said Germany's yeah. negative democratic demographic trend has to be counteracted. Mass immigration has a high potential for conflict is not, and it's not viable economic solution. The only mid and long term solution is to attain a higher birth rate by the native population by stimulating family politics. And uh, this is uh, in the program, and of course, in the program is also a huge paragraph against abortion in order to simulate, this is what they call offensive familienpolitik, offensive family politics. So I think this is an interesting point. And then you said it's, it's uh, not about uh, the babies, it's about um, maintaining a certain understanding of the role of the woman, right? of an engendered division of labor, actually. Um, uh, and what else did you say? I think, I think one point I think it's interesting to make before we open to the public is you all uh, talked about right-wing politicians, about the influence of religion. You all talked about conservatives and, uh, and of course, fascists. And um, fascists that are, of course, and we talked about this in the last session, um, one of their big uh, credos is also not being only against migrants, but also being against feminists. We have become targets of right-wing populists. So why do you think it's, so, um, it's such a crucial uh, point for them to, to be against abortions? I think they're also afraid of the power of women. As you said, they want to keep us down, they want to have control, they don't want us to choose and um, I think that's one point because also AFD, um, they want us to go back into the kitchen. I remember when I read like the first, um, how do you say it, um, this Erste Wahlprogramm, <laughs> they said like they're also against the support of the um, das frei gewählte Modell alleinerziehend. I don't know how to say it in English. So it says that... The voluntary model yeah, if of you being choose a lonely mother, yes. single mother. Yes. So they say if you are stupid enough to choose to be a single mom or a single dad, then it's um, first of all your fault, it's your mistake, and so we won't support you. So this whole construct of family, they want us to um, support or to live is super outdated. Mm -hmm. And also, we should not forget to say that the paragraph we're talking about is a Nazi era paragraph that was used to punish Jewish doctors. Um, so we're like, our politics are pretty much holding something from back in the days we really don't want here. I think we all here want to um, want men and also fascists and right-wing parties to stay out of our bedrooms and out of our bodies, out of our womb and uterus <laughs> and nothing else. Mm -hmm. And uh, my last question, just for um, mentioning it, what about this term of pro-life? What about um, yeah, the right of the photos to live, what would you say? Why is feminism so busy with uh, defending the right for self-determination and not defending the right for life? Would you say, what would you say to this? Because there are no rules for that, it's about morals and if people can't handle morals and only hear about whatever, like religious views or whatever, um, then it's beginning to be a problem. Because no one can say when um, life really begins or when it's, when it's, you know, science says it's human life the moment it merges, but it's not a child. And that's what they, like pro-life activists and right-wing parties use, they're always talking about murder and about childs. And this varies from culture to culture and from religion to religion. So it's really hard. You, you can't really say this is right or wrong, but you should have an inner compass, a moral compass. And I think that 
something that is like eight weeks or 12 weeks old can never be more important than a person who can get pregnant. It's actually a very nice saying, you know, that um, I heard some counselors saying to women who have to, ha as a, who are going to have an abortion, you know, and, and she was saying like, you know, when you have a miscarriage, then it is because your body wasn't ready, you know, and if you have an abortion, then it means like you were not ready, you know, and I think this actually also gets gets a very interesting view on again also what is an what is an embryo, you know, like uh, miscarriages is actually something that happens, I think, up to 30 percent of all pregnancy and in miscarriage, you know. So um, I think the, the, the you know the the, the idea that um, as a, also like killing a child is really something that gives a totally different idea about um, um, yeah what an abortion is you know and what I for example find super interesting about the abortion pill you know is also that um, also this is done like you know you shouldn't or like it's normally done up to the twelfth week or in Germany up to the ninth week you know. And uh, what I find super interesting is that this is actually a medicine where women can really go through an abortion, like experience it like it is a miscarriage, you know, and actually then actu also see um, what it is, that it actually feels and looks like a menstruation, you know, um, because it is very close uh, to a menstruation when you do it very early, and normally abortion is done when the woman has access, when the woman has information, you know, um, it is done normally very early, like six, seven, eight week, you know, and then the woman actually sees, yeah, it is very close to a menstruation, this is very close to an experience I have actually every month, you know, um, so this for me also showed how alienated we are from so many processes that happen in our body by medicine and by politics, you know, because we are told that it is something different, you know. Um, and I find it, yeah, super interesting that also to get also the feedback from women who go through a medical abortion to actually see, oh, okay, this actually looks like the same, like, as if I have my period, you know, because there's, of course, you don't see an embryo because it's so small, you know, you basically see bloody tissue, you know, which is what you see all the time when you, when you have your menstruation, you know, so... Yeah, I think as this is a trigger um, topic, it's also, um, it's totally right what you say, but it's also important to say that it's really a personal thing, because if you want a child, then it's a child the beginning, like from the very beginning, I guess, and if you have a miscarriage, it can be very, very, very painful. It's not like menstrual blood or whatever, but if you don't want a child and you don't want to get pregnant, then most of the time you can handle it, but that's only shows that it's a very personal thing and not a scientific thing or an ideological thing. Yeah, you're totally right. You know, this in the end about our imagination, you know, what an embryo is. And this is then also showing what kind of emotional connection we have to it, you know, we want to give it, you know, yeah. But I also find it just to, you know, because I, you know, I find it, also I think, uh, you know, abortion politics or uh, women's health is generally something where ideology is given much more space than, n like, scientific facts, you know, and that I find super problematic. So I find it also important to, you know, maybe just say, you know, like the, the new, um, uh, <laughs> the new science, you know, um, actually says like an, a fetus doesn't have any pain or consciousness before the 24th week, you know, so just to put that information out here, um, because this is not something that people hear very often, and they're also, of course, thinking, is it painful, you know, or something like this, but uh, yeah, this is the new scientific uh, research, you know, it's like 24th week, and abortions are taking place much, much, much earlier, you know. Last comment? I think my last comment is um, to your point about using the term pro-life. Um, and in my organization, we don't use the term pro-life. We talk about people who are anti-abortion because we see ourselves as being pro-life. We're pro the life of the mother. We're pro the life of wanted children. Um, but I think where the antis um, do really well is they play on people's heartstrings and they say you're denying life. And I think it also comes back to this point of everyone has a different idea of when life begins. And that's why we should be pro-choice. Because if you don't want an abortion or if you don't want a, an abortion beyond a particular point, then don't have one. But you shouldn't be able to take that choice away from other people. Yes, so I would like to open the discussion to the people in the room, but also in the people watching on the live stream. You know you can participate um, in our discussion and I might have some comments here in my, on my um, computer under hashtag Femme Stammtisch. Yes, exactly. 
So feel free to participate. Um, I want to open the floor by giving uh, the uh, voice to an uh, organization that is working here in Dresden on these issues. It's Crit Med. Um, it's an organization and they, they will actually introduce themselves. We're very happy there's a lot of uh, work uh, being done here in Dresden on this issue. We are aware of that. There's pro-choice Dresden, there's um, uh, a lot of initiatives. So we're happy that you're here uh, supporting the cause. And yeah, maybe you can say what you're up to. Okay, hello. Um, we are Ma Maya, Sophia and Karina from CritMed. And first of all, thank you very much for this very important and inspiring panel today at the Deutsche Sigine Museum. Um, we are very happy to be here and to be a part of it. CritMate uh, stands for Critical Perspective uh, on Medicine. And we are a group of people, mainly medical students from Dresden. And we formed CritMate with the wish to represent um, a critical position towards the medical education and the healthcare system in Germany. Because for us, Medicine is never neutral, it is always political. And what is defined as right or wrong or as sick or healthy, it always reflects the political and social climate. Yeah, so we followed <coughs> the widely discussed topic of abortion and reproductive, reproductive rights. Um, and it's been a major focus of our politi political work during the past months. And we kind of saw the example of medical students for choice in Berlin and the USA, and we formed our own group, um, Pro-Choice. And for example, in January, we took part in the national campaign against Article 219A. And in September, we were part of planning the Safe Abortion Day here in Dresden. And in our opinion, access to abortion needs to be legal, safe, and self-determined. And it's very important to destigmatize this medical procedure. And the only way we can reach this is by continuously searching the open discussion, like we're doing today, and furthermore, teaching medical students and health professionals about this procedure. Um, we acknowledge that this issue is very delicate and as a society we don't all agree on everything. Oops. Um, but for us it's uh, very important that uh, for women's rights and reproductive justice that all people have a free choice and the opportunity to make their own decisions when it comes to their own body. So uh, this weekend, on the 8th and 9th of November, uh, we, we organized an event called Self-Determination, Gender and Reproduction at the University Hospital here in Dresden. Uh, and besides hosting a papaya workshop, uh, we will talk about the variety of gender and sexuality, the legal framework around abortion in Germany, sexual pleasure, uh, as well as feminist perspectives on prenatal diagnostics and other reproductive technologies. And everybody is welcome uh, <laughs> to come attend the workshops. Uh, there are flyers at the door, um, or you can just come to talk with us. And we hope to see you there. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, so feel free to comment our discussion, ask questions, just say what you think. There is someone over there. I hope and this uh, is open now online. Yes, okay. Um, yeah, uh, we definitely define there is a problem, but I also want to like to hear a solution. Uh, could you offering. please speak better into the mic? It's very bad for us to hear oh, yeah. what you're saying. Okay, sorry. So we definitely define the problem here. And I would like to also know your opinion of the solution to that problem. So what we can do as the society and how we can get involved to change something. Thank you. Is there other? Because we talked so much, I would like to give the weight a bit to 
Um, the floor now. Um, there is a question in the room. Also, it can also be answered by you guys okay. over there. Um, this is someone. Uh, we also have a lot of activists from Ukraine, from uh, Russia here. She That's will me. talk about <laughs> it. This is also. Um, we're we're happy that uh, yes, English is a language that they can also follow. So, yes. Aber ich würde doch gerne Deutsch sprechen, wenn es möglich ist. Okay. Allein die Frage, eben gerade, wo wir aus einem ganz anderen Kulturraum kommen, da würde ich gerne wissen, wegen diesem Paragraph 219, also diesem, diesem halt, ähm, Verbot auf Werbung, wo kommt es hier überhaupt, so etwas äh, als Werbung zu bezeichnen? Das, das wundert mich so sehr. Einfach so historisch hat es einen Grund, dass dann irgendwie vermutet wird, dass so etwas als Werbung irgendwie klingen könnte. Das wundert mich wirklich sehr und würde ich gerne dann mehr Infos dafür dazu eben kriegen. Danke. So she was asking, uh, where does this prohibition of so-called advertising for abortions come from? Um, because she finds it absurd. Is there any, do you have, uh, is there any more? I would like to um, uh, encourage you to, to participate. I mean, I have uh, someone actually in the internet. Um, maybe we can uh, post the quote of Gege H is uh, the name of uh, the person who wrote it. And they say it's not going to be visualized. Okay, I, so I read it out for you. Uh, they say, one of the problems in Germany regarding access is also the consultation you need with a specialist who decides if you're fit to go through it. How are these experiences for most women? So there is now, I think, three, three questions on the table. Yes. Can we, can we give the mic over there? Sorry, where's the question? Yeah. So, um, I think um, all people on the panel uh, agree that uh, you should indeed have a choice uh, if you want to have a kid or not. Um, so my question is actually um, if you also think that uh, a man should have the choice if he wants to have a baby or not, if he wants to uh, have a paternity or not. And uh, also if you agree that a man should have that choice, um, how would you implement that? Okay. So now there's four questions on the table and now I will give it back. There's also one over there. Okay, uh, yes, so we have someone of you maybe wants to answer to what do we do, the what do we do question. Some other wants to answer to the where does this abortion law come from. Then the experiences of most women with a specialist and the right of the man to decide if they want fraternity. Yeah, I would like to answer the first question. Um, everyone is allowed to, to give information about abortion except abortion providers. So everyone here, you can all give information about abortion and um, how you do it. You can be creative, I don't know. Um, but this would be something, I think, to spread the, the information um, and to talk about it a lot, so to, to um, deconstruct the taboo and the stigma. And also all um, doctors who have um, practices, house ärzte, house ärztinnen, um, who don't provide abortions, they could all have information on their internet pages about abortion, for example. I just want to encourage that point. You know, I think it is a lot about changing the knowledge 
and sharing experiences about abortion. You know, like that women have spaces where they can share their experiences. I think this is something that is super missed, you know, also by l like the concerned woman, you know, that they don't feel so isolated anymore, you know, and alone with this. Um, but also to really change that people understand what the, l the life reality of women is and also having an, an abortion experience, you know, and also, as you say, you know, like create structures of self-help, you know, also um, I can just say because I, I'm, I'm pretty amazed, you know, but all the love and solidarity that we in this group of Chachabasha like experience, you know, like it's really pretty great to see what kind of self-organized abortion access can can look like, you know, and this is also why I'm also why we're also happy to, you know, team up with different organizations, um, also internationally, um, which is yeah getting closer more and more, you know, and there's there's really amazing stuff going on and to encourage these kind of structures of self-help and make it visible. I think it is a lot about visibility in the end, you know. So creating this it's a uh, yeah something I would like to encourage. I think so too. It oh, is it on? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, it's about visibility, but it's also about being loud, and it's about like forcing politics to change. And I think like if we look up to the Alabama abortion ban, it were like 25 white men deciding about the bodies of women or humans who can give birth. And I think also in Germany. I kind of have to laugh when someone is telling me that a man is in charge of my health. It can never be. And so um, keeping this whole debate up in the media was one of my aims through the petition. It was not only like, of course, I wasn't sitting there and being mad about what is he doing with five millions. At the end, I don't care about five millions. He could use that for hebammen or whatever, for the children and mothers who are already here. But that was not the point. It was about keeping this topic up in the media and going on their nerves. And I think this is something we have to do again and again and again. And we keep on doing this. Like. You know, at Jens Spahn on Twitter, Instagram, whatever, we really should not be silenced by them because they ignore us and we should go on and do it again and again until they hear us. So everyone should speak up because those that actually um, perform the actual acts are not allowed to. Yes, we have to speak up for you in the future when you actually perform abortions. Uh, does any one of you want to uh, address the question of uh, the consultation with a specialist and uh, also the question of fraternity? Um, well, there are studies about how, how women um, mm, experience this obligatory counseling, which the question was referring to. and. Um, Many experience it as being, um, they, they think they have to, um, s um, oh my God, <laughs> justify, justify themselves and bring arguments why they need this abortion. So it's not really a natural um, counseling situation, how it should be, but they feel like, oh, I have to have good arguments. If not, they won't give me the stamp and then I can't do it. This almost never happens, but it's just, very artificial situation. So um, there, there are studies about this, and this is why I p think absolutely um, counseling should be um, voluntar voluntarily. If not, it cannot um, have its helping effect, I think. As a maybe to, to give also another twist about how I also find how, how crazy this demand is, you know, to have a mandatory counseling. I would also say, okay, if you think a woman who has an abortion needs a mandatory counseling, why not a woman who actually wants to have a child? Because that is much more responsibility, you know? So you could also like ask her, do you think you can really do this, you know, for like 18 years? You know, do you have enough money? You know, do you have a good partner? Also, like, why do we think like, you know, a woman has to justify herself when she wants to have an abortion, which is actually just a choice for herself, you know, and not about another child, you know? with a consciousness and uh, you know uh, so uh, so i think that's also kind of twists around the, the whole uh, like how, how we take things for granted you know how we take it for granted that women has to ju justify themselves in front of a state you know in, 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 in front of another institution you know to kind of yeah be totally belittling and i think also what you say like i think it's great if there is 
the offer of free counseling, I think it's necessary and good in every way, you know, like social, psychological, financial. I think it's great if every gynecologist can say, okay, if you consider an abortion, these are the places where you can go and have free consultation if you want to, you know, but having it forced just really totally doesn't give a free, good, friendly, caring atmosphere for, for, for the woman. She just feels, you know, sh it's, a, it's a burden. She has to kind of like perform, you know. Yeah. And it can be very helpful just to, because I mean, if it's forced, then it's like gross, but it can be very helpful if you're in a conflict situation. So it was for me because I had something, uh, someone really, like she was so neutral. And um, so it was good to go there. It can, of course, be very helpful, but um, yeah, many women already know very soon what their decision is. Some not, but some. And for, for those, it's really also a time question because it takes time, then you have to go there, then you have to wait three days and make an appointment somewhere, go there. It, it, it can um, delay so much that you maybe can't do a medication abortion anymore in some cases. So this is really a barrier, an access barrier, that it is obligatory. But of course, there should be a lot of offering. Yeah. Yes, do we have more uh, contributions from the audience? I can speak a moment to the question about, um, uh, I'm, I feel like the question about a man's right to paternity is about w a man's right to decide whether his partner should have an abortion. Is that right? Or have I misunderstood? Yeah. Uh, no, no, that was. <laughs> anyway, uh, no, that, that was not what I was uh, was trying to say. Okay. Uh, so it was more. Um, so you said before that you were in a toxic relationship, and I was just trying to say that that can happen to men as well. And uh, yeah, what what do you do in that in that situation as a as a man? If you're a man and the woman you're with is pregnant but you don't want it, yeah. I'm very, very sorry to say that, but um, you have to deal with this. If she wants to have the baby, then she'll get the baby and the other way around. This is one of the few things or the least things that you can't take from us because it's our body and our decision. I don't want to, you no, know, I, I totally, you know, I totally get the question also the other way around. Yeah. Like what no, if... You didn't get me wrong. Like I'm not saying that a man should have the right to, uh, to say if you should have an abortion or not. I'm just saying a man should have the right. Oh, the question is, should a man have the right to be a father or not? Uh, to be the father of the child or not? After it was born. Uh, after it was born. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, you're like, you're the father and it should be like, you should not only have the right, you should care for your child if you're a, like, if you're a good person and if you're not someone who is cruel to the woman because of course women have reasons to, um, to, you know, how do you say it? To don't want the fathers to see the child. I see that and I know people who are in that situation, but of course a woman can't like or shouldn't decide, yeah, I think he's cool or he's not cool, so he he's not allowed to see the kid. Is that the correct question? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the moment uh, it is clear it is your child, you're also obliged by the German state to pay custody. I mean, this is already uh, a right or also an obligation that you are, um, yes, uh, assigned to through law. So I don't know if there's so much to discuss about it here because it's already, um, it is, it is uh, written in law that you actually are obliged to also be the father <laughs> in this way or another. Was that the question? I, I think the question is a little bit different. I think the question is, a woman can, because she can abort, she can decide whether she has the money or the capacity to care for this child. And I guess a man doesn't have that capacity once it's um, once he has, um, um, uh, how do you say it in English? Uh, once he has fathered a child, 
he can't decide, okay, I don't have the money to bring it up <coughs> or I don't want to bring it up in the same way that a woman can decide to do that. And I guess that is the question. Ah, uh, yeah, right. Yeah, but it's the same right because a woman can't say no after the birth too. So you have the same right <laughs> or not. You just have to take care of it. Yes. Um, shall we continue? There is a. There was uh, this one question about the why is um, advertising illegal and where does it come from? And yes. I think you addressed it, Nika, with the Nazi law that it goes back to yes, the Nazi exactly. law. Yes, exactly. That's why I didn't know want to put it again because it was actually answered. We can answer it very short. It's yes. the um, lack of trust in women. It's because people think that if um, abortions are legal, then we would do more abortions, abortions because it's so funny not to have safe sex and to get pregnant and because you don't have to think about it then if you can just have an abortion. I don't know. It's something that really um, degrades women and our brains and our emotions because it's not like that, of course. But I think that's what Jens Spahn thinks. <laughs> and, it and you said it before, it comes from the Nazi era, this paragraph from 1933. And it's also all, th all the saying, the words they use in it is very old fashioned uh, language. So you, you directly see that it's a very old paragraph. Yeah, just to make that clear, if there were posters saying abortion is great, which we don't think and we wouldn't ever say, but if there were posters like that, no woman ever would s would think like, oh, then let's have an abortion, you know, and that's just a consequence, just to break it down. It's yes. not happening. <laughs> There's a um, comment uh, on the internet um, about exactly that, the representations of abortion in uh, media. Uh, so it's Francesca Kabisch. She says, as a filmmaker, I'm working on abortions and how they are depicted in films and TV, TV series. Most of the images only show sad and traumatized women when they are going through an abortion. How do you experience that these representations influence the emotions of people having to decide regarding abortion, for example, the expectation that one must be depressed afterwards? That's a great problem. I think also many doctors um, believe uh, in this post-abortion syndrome and um, I know a lot of um, um, examples where uh, unwanted pregnant people um, <laughs> were told by their doctors, um, but you might, you might regret that later when you see children, you might always regret it and, and they, they really have a hard decision then because of that and also um, the studies show that um, the, the psychological distress is higher um, w when, you, when you always hear these kind of things. Yeah. I was probably going to comment. I think it's actually starting to change, certainly in the UK and in I think in a lot of um, TV shows and films that have been made in the US and the UK in recent years. I don't know if that's the same in Germany, but I do think this is really starting to change. They're treating it much more as it is, which I think is really pleasing. I can't think of any examples off the top of my head, though. Um, but like actually the Netflix series Glow had a very good abortion sequence in it. Um, there's quite a few where they're really just treating it more like the just a medical procedure that it can be for many women. Yeah, and I think one one problem is that I mean, as I also see the change, you know, which is very good. But I think it has a lot to do with you know people like us pushing for this again and again, you know, like that there has to be a different visibility of the topic. But I think it has a, as a seriously a lot to do with the fact that most filmmakers were men before, you know, like and who, who just had a very cliched idea about like life reality of woman, you know. So this also really shows that there is a a turn, you know, there's a change when, for example, also women become more um, present and popular and um, powerful in the media, especially, you know, because it is about representation, you know. And I think one, one thing that is very enticing or was very enticing to male filmmakers when they were talking about abortion 
is to show it as, as, as dramatic as possible simply because then it's better for the film. You know, like it's more interesting to show like the, you know, crazy struggle a woman is going through or destroyed the whole family, destroyed, you know, and afterwards, after, you know, 10, 10 years later, you know, you find out it's all about the abortion, why, why, why that family drama happened, you know, it's like, it's a nice plot, you know, it's, an, it's like an interesting plot that you can use, you know, and I think this is why it is always, you know, depicted so dramatically and horribly, you know. Yeah. Maybe I would want to give uh, uh, the mic to the, to the audience again in the room um, for a last time is a possibility to make questions, comments, participate. There is one question over here in the, third in the first row, Leonie. The first row here. Um, first of all, thank you for the great talk. And I would like to add a question to the part about the uh, mandatory counseling, because to be honest, I did not know that only uh, practicing doctors are not allowed to talk about it and to publicly um, tell where you can do it, what it works for. And I was wondering, why are all the Schwangerschaftsabbruchsberatungsstellen not really publicly um, saying what women can do, how the procedure is like, if you're not allowed it. I feel like what you've already said in the internet, you always find terrible, terrible pictures. So apparently there is an option to change these kind of things if all the, the, the um, institutions that already have to talk about this topic a lot and are apparently able to talk about it. And I'm wondering how we can change that fact. I'm really surprised that apparently so many people could do it, but they don't. The law has to change. This is the problem. It's not only about 219A, it's about 280 who criminalizes this. That means, and most of the people don't know, that abortion is illegal in Germany. It's only, you can't just not be jailed or whatever, punished, if some points are um, made. If you had this um, talk to Beratungsstelle, <laughs> and um, consultation. consultation and stuff. But first of all, it's illegal. And this is what keeps us all from giving information. And also, um, it keeps up the stigma. And this is something I really want to tell everybody here and out. If you had an abortion, please talk about that. Not in public, you don't need that, but talk about that with your friends. When I had my you know, when I talked about openly about my abortion, so many friends came to me and friends of friends and were like, I had it too. And I was wondering, like, why didn't you ever tell me? It would be so much helpful because there is a lack of diversity in the narratives and the narratives are what make women sick or believe they have to fear guilt or whatever. So what we can do as a society is really normalize it and not normalize it in a way Jens Spahn is afraid of or whatever, but normalize it in a way that it is actually part of our lives and it won't go away. It should just be safe and legal and not a taboo topic. So spread it if you had it. <laughs> Is there uh, any other last comment, last question? Over there. Uh, es war vorhin noch die Frage nach Lösungen. Das würde ich gerne noch hören. Ja. We didn't understand. We don't äh, ja, die Dame hat gefragt, vorhin gab es ja noch die Frage, was, was sind die Lösungen, was können wir tun? Aber ich glaube, das habt ihr insofern adressiert, dass ihr, also ich glaube, das war gerade die Antwort, dass wir mehr darüber sprechen müssen. Und, äh, oder meinen Sie mit Lösungen was anderes? Ja, wer hatte nach Lösungen gefragt? Da drüben wurde nach Lösungen gefragt. Wir haben das schon versucht äh, äh, zu beantworten. Vielleicht können wir in den Schlussworten jetzt darauf hinkommen. It was about solutions and I think mm. um, there was some answers because we are not the lawmakers. So it's uh, you have to it vote was very for the clear. Right. One of solution will be to stop the illegalization and to stop the criminalization. So I think a lot has been said. Um, you want to also react on that, and then I would say we s we do a last uh, round here if you want. 
I could maybe just add uh, to the solution part um, that, yes, obviously, um, abortion is a medical procedure, so it has to be part of the curriculum of what we learn as medical students. I think that we don't, the f our generation of feminists, we don't have the awareness uh, that the right or the access to abortion is something that other feminists have fought for and that the excess is declining. I don't think people have the awareness. Um, and as Alicia says, there's a decrease in 40% or something like that. Um, so that's something that we can talk about. Um, and then there are also alternative solutions, like for example, in the Netherlands, uh, there are abortion doctors who are just like general practitioners. So that would also be good to increase the access to abortion. Um, or, yeah, I mean, we can talk about those kinds of steps, yeah. So is there anything that you want to say as a last word, if there is anything from around here? Yes? Yes. <laughs> No, and um, this was was one one thought I still wanted to share um, that came up uh, in in the past half an hour, um, which is simply that I think one problem with the stigmatization of abortion is also that we have a very technocratic view on sexuality. You know, I think that um, most people do not know, you know, how much. Um, how, how high the failure quote of contraceptives are, for example, you know, because I think the, this idea that, you know, like abortion is something that happens like not often and it's just women who really fail and who are irresponsible and egocentric. Also this idea is just, I think, still very strong because we do not talk about how, how complex sexuality also is, you know, like it's not perfect, it's not easy to organize, it's not perfectly 100% to manage, you know, I think that there, there was kind of a, a trade-off in a way that, you know, if women want to live sexuality freely then they also have to manage it 100% perfect and you know totally you know like be total control about everything and there's you know you cannot make any mistakes you know and this is what we don't talk about anymore you know the, the how, how often yeah contraceptives fail and also how the also, also like the lack of information when contraceptives fail you know like the lack of responsibility that we um, you know demand from men for example also in the in the whole spectrum of contraceptives, you know. Um, I think this is, I, th I, th I think this, this whole, the whole field of women's health is lacking compassion, lacking understanding, lacking a, a wholesome idea of what our bodies are, of what desire, sexuality and our lives are, you know, because we just have this like very me medicalized, technocratic idea about it. And I think breaking up and sharing these kind of abortion stories also, but as well, I cannot, you know, say it often enough, also birth stories and pregnancy stories all together, you know, um, I think that really can change a whole idea about what what, what like what, what it means to be fertile what it means to you know to become pregnant you know um yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> very <laughs> nicely put yes um, something there yeah i just we want to also to the question what you can do i think we all i mean you are here you informed yourself um which is great already and in in now many anti-abortion networks are really um, getting stronger. There was just a congress um, where they taught um, how can you um, create a pro-life chapter at your university and it's really organized many workshops. How can you talk to um, women to convince them to have their child? And so we ha also have to be active, I think. And also, uh, luckily, in many cities there have been created um, pro-choice bündnisse and groups and you can surely in in any city either um, found one or or go to one which is existing already and um, i think the the protest of the population has really big effect for example these um protection zones um which have been um uh, introduced in hessen um, um in front of um counseling um houses, <laughs> counseling uh, institutions, um, things like this. And also the medical students who, are, um, who have become so active in so many uh, cities and they really, in some cities, they could change the syllabus already, the medical teaching. Um, so there's a lot you can do, I think, if you are um, organizing yourself in groups. Yeah. Great. 
Thank you. I think uh, that was important to mention. Um, uh, we will close this discussion now. We're over time already. Um, I think what uh, was made clear that is that the lack of information does not prevent abortions, just makes them less safe. Um, uh, that helping to access abortion is not encouraging women to have them, it's just the help for them to want them, to access them, that abortion activists are not against children and family making, but it is also this whole discourse is not about children, is not about that the state would want more children and maybe care for them, but it's more about population control and maintaining the role of the woman in a place where she can make unpaid labor. Um, so I think it's also um, important to say that in countries where the laws are more liberal, there is not necessarily more abortions. Um, it's the other way around. I, I would say in the UK there are a lot more abortions than there are here. Yes. And the population here is higher. I don't understand it. Yes. We will. We yeah. won't. Because <laughs> we take <laughs> everyone's abortions, there. yeah. But actually there is there is not a correlation between liberal law and... Um, but we cannot um, open this discussion now because I'm on, the, on my final <laughs> statement. So um, I think... Uh, and there was also a lot of suggestions of what you do so abortions are part of your life. They have to be safe, accessible and affordable. Thus was it for tonight. Please come again to the next Feminist Stammtisch in next year. Thank you for being here, everybody. Thank you for my guests uh, here. Have a nice evening.